Thank you all for joining us today for a new session of the Gessi webinar series. The Gessi webinar series serves as a platform for the Gessi network members to share experience and expertise in evidence synthesis and to learn about potential collaboration. My name is Zahra Saad. I'm a research assistant at the Gessi Secretariat, and I will be moderating the session today. So before we begin, and if you are using the GoToWebinar for the first time, as you might have noticed, you are automatically muted. So if you would like to submit any comment or question, please use the tab on the right to type in your question. Or if you would like to comment or address our a presenter directly, you can use the raise your hand button and we can unmute you so that you can ask the question directly with our presenter. So today's session is on contextual and institution fact, institutional factors affecting evidence use in public agencies. Uh, our presenters are Vanessa Weyroch and Kirchhoff Atonjom. Um, I will start by introducing Vanessa is a co-founder of Politics and Ideas and professor of the Universidad Estrel in Argentina. She has worked in the field of policy and research for the last 17 years, especially with Latin America think tanks and policymakers through knowledge generation, capacity building, and mentorship. She has created an online platform to offer courses on policy influence planning, research communication, monitoring and assessment of policy influence, training regional organizations as well as organizations from Africa, Asia, and Eastern Europe. In recent years, she has specialized in an innovative methods to facilitate the learning and design of future scenarios such as theory U. Kirchhoff is an executive director of Pax Africa, a pan-African think tank operating to improve uptake of research and other forms of evidence and policy processes and practice from the perspectives of information systems research and knowledge management. With over seven years of experience within the field of evidence to policy, he coordinated in Ghana the Earthwild BQR program, Hakaiko, which was funded by DFID to build capacity for the use of research evidence among policymaking organizations in Ghana, South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe. This earned him a role in the new program by DFID to strengthen the use of evidence in policymaking in three countries, Ghana, Pakistan, and Uganda. Kirchhoff has also worked to improve the supply of evidence through the TEAL program, which was funded by Gates Foundation. Um, thank you both of you to, to be with us. And thank you for joining us. I will leave the floor now to Vanessa so that she can start with her presentation. Thank you so much, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Hope you can hear me well. Uh, it would be nice if participants can uh, chime in and um, let us know. <laughs> we see your names, but if you can let us know which organization, if you are presenting an organization or if you're working independently, what are you doing? I see here Emily, among the participants, Emily Heiter, who uh, works at INASP and INASP has been our partner in developing the framework that we will share today. Um, so if you can just uh, yeah, say hi and, and let us know uh, what you do or which organization you represent, that's going to be helpful. And also let me know, can you hear me well? Yes? Okay, so uh, I can't see anyone there saying, if you can hear me well, I just need to check that. Um, yes, Vanessa, uh, you're very clear. Oh, good, so, good. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. So uh, our main purpose today is to share with you a framework that we have jointly developed at Politics and Ideas within us 
but uh, mainly how it has been used. And that's going to be Kurt Chaps talking about the on, on the ground experience uh, on how he used this, uh, what we call a lens of a framework uh, to understand and, and detect entry points to improve the use of knowledge in public agency in Ghana. So um, I'm going to navigate through the framework. We have, a, uh, we produced uh, this framework in a conceptual paper and we also wrote a practical paper, but we decided to reflect it and to share it widely in an interactive way. So that's what you're seeing now on the screen. Uh, this uh, framework emerged from our conviction after years of working uh, on the ground with public agencies and public um, policy research institutions as well to improve the use of knowledge in policy. And again and again, when we're listening or telling our own stories about how uh, knowledge was used or not used <laughs> in policy making processes and decisions, uh, context emerged as a very recurrent uh, reason to say, okay, this helped because this happened in the, uh, these uh, things happened within the context and, or it didn't work out because the context affected uh, the possibilities of using research. So we started saying like, what do we mean <laughs> when we are saying, and we're talking about context. And that's why we decided to get into this work and really understand more deeply how does context operate and influence our chances to improve the use of knowledge in a public agency? Let me say also that this lens or this framework that I'm going to walk you through in a couple of uh, seconds uh, is mainly geared towards helping public agencies, but it can be used as well by any other organizations and stakeholders supporting these agencies and also by by international organizations. In fact, we are undergoing a, pro a work with um, UNICEF at UNICEF, applying the lens to help UNICEF also understand in some regions how it can improve the, the, the way they are currently using knowledge. And when I'm saying knowledge, we are including here different types of evidence for policy making. So we're talking about research, but also about data emerging from monitoring and evaluation efforts, citizen perspectives, and so on. So we have a wide uh, concept of what uh, knowledge is and how it can be then incorporated into decision making. As you will see, we have like six large factors or dimensions that account for context. When we say context, we're referring to two external main dimensions, which are macro context, you will see it here, and the relationships that any public agencies, public agencies or state agencies under uh, great circles, and they have relationships, relationships among themselves, which influence, of course, the way knowledge is used and produced, but also relationships with several types of external stakeholders. So this would be like two external like, dimensions. And we're, we also uh, look into internal factors, right? Those that are, um, explain or come from the way of, from the organization itself. Um, and this uh, framework also addresses and, and looks into both uh, visible uh, changes like processes or behaviors that enable or hinder the use of knowledge, but also invisible ones such as motivations, incentives or the culture, the existing culture for knowledge use. So it's quite comprehensive and uh, as you see, even the graph has a lot of circles and it's a little bit complex, but let me say also then share that this is a very flexible tool that can be adapted to each organization's unique context. So uh, in other words, it's basically a lens through which you can look at your organization or the agencies that you are working with and start understanding or detecting which are the key entry points or the obstacles when trying to uh, move on a large effort in terms of knowledge use. The macro context, and, and this is, I'm, I'm going to go uh, a bit uh, quickly through this, but then you, I invite you to, to do your own navigation and, and really uh, double click and go into more detail. But as you, you will see the, this interactive lens allows you to understand what each dimension is. And also, as you can see now, 
each dimension, in each dimension we have found that there are several recurrent subdimensions uh, that came out and emerged as uh, the significant ones when trying to understand uh, the degree and the possibility of knowledge use in a public agency. Uh, let, uh, I, I forgot also to say that uh, when, const when building the, the framework, we uh, did a combination of literature review about context and how it affects uh, the use of policy, uh, research in policy, but we also interviewed more than 50 policymakers and practitioners who are doing this every day in developing countries. So the dimensions emerge from our consultations, our readings, and, and what uh, emerge as being the recurrent main dimensions that one has to look at when thinking about, okay, I'm going to design or I'm implementing a project or an initiative to improve the, the use of knowledge, what should I look at? So macro context is the, what you sometimes in the literature is referred as context. We, we understand context as a more, in a more holistic way, but of course the macro context, which is the large scenario in which policy making takes place uh, is very important to look at. And this includes uh, usual factors acknowledged in literature, a like general, what you might include in a political economy analysis, like the extent of um, freedom, um, the, um, the degree of development of civil society, but also other, as you will see on the right-hand side and the left-hand side, other key sub-dimensions like how is the power distributed in a political system uh, or whether there are consultation and participatory participation uh, processes that incorporate other stakeholders when making policy decisions uh, or whether there is or not a strong strategic planning culture. Then we have this second uh, dimension, which I mentioned has to do with the relationships among state agencies, but also uh, between the public agency and other stakeholders. Uh, so if you double click there, you will see another subset of uh, sub-dimensions that account for the way these relationships can influence um, any effort to improve the use of knowledge in policy. And in each uh, dimension, we also detected, you can, um, we're not going to go through this today, but if you're interested, we also documented emerging pra practices that have to do with dealing with these relationships and building on them so as to increase the chances of uh, research uh, being used and produced for policy making. Among the sub-dimensions, some are more related, of course, and, and probably if you are doing this on our everyday basis, they will sound familiar to, to, to you. Some have to do with the way state agencies interact. Of course, for example, the flow of information between different government jurisdictions and levels uh, is very important to look at when thinking about uh, these policy making processes and the way knowledge is incorporated. The degree of coordination, right? If the agencies are very well coordinated, probably the flow and the use of uh, knowledge will be shared and there will be uh, more opportunities to do this in a uh, coordinated matter with public policies uh, compared to agencies operating in a very isolated way. And thinking about some uh, external relationships with other stakeholders, there are uh, very important factors such as whether there are uh, existing formal channels uh, to interact from the state agencies with uh, researchers and research institutions, uh, the number and the type of civil society actors that are currently and regularly involved uh, in decision uh, making processes as well as their vested interests right or the existence of policy forums uh, diverse policy forums or epistemic communities that are provide a regular space for uh, policy making agencies to use as a sounding board or an interaction space uh, for both production and use of knowledge. So these are the two large external uh, dimensions. Then we can go and look into the state agency in itself, right? And there are four main, what we call internal factors that have to do with the, with the state agency. One is uh, culture. Uh, this is a very significant dimension. There is a set of uh, 
as I mentioned earlier on, sort of invisible and sometimes quite implicit factors such as the beliefs and values around uh, the value. <laughs> sorry about being repetitive at the value of knowledge for policy making and what leaders and uh, senior management believe how and when and what sort of also knowledge is um, to be used or produced to inform their policies uh, as well as other sub, sub factors like incentives right are the bureaucrats and the uh, stay uh, the street level uh, policy makers really do, do they have incentives uh, to produce uh, knowledge or to use it in their daily work. Another very important factor had to do with the, open, the degree of openness to change. When the culture is more rigid and it's very difficult to change the way policies are crafted and decided and discussed, of course, there's uh, much less and, 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 and a little margin uh, to come up with uh, new knowledge and to, to use knowledge for those decisions. Another important dimension has to do with uh, the capacity of the organization, right? The ability that an organization has to use its resources to fulfill its goals and, and missions. So the, uh, the muscle <laughs> that the organization has, of course, affects and, and of course, the, the way uh, senior management, leadership, and human resources are both uh, capable and interested in producing and using knowledge significantly affect uh, how it ends up being used and, and co-produced. Uh, legal capacities, they are important too, whether the organization or state agencies has formal processes to commission and to use and incorporate uh, knowledge in decision making. Among these sub-dimensions, uh, it is important to highlight the role of leadership. This came out and emerged as one of the most important uh, sub-dimensions and, uh, and within organizational capacity, but in general, when leaders are really convinced and eager to improve and increase the use of knowledge in policy, uh, changes are seen in culture. I mean, they are able to create new incentives or to motivate their staff, uh, they are also willing to open up channels of interaction with uh, other state agencies or external stakeholders that can provide new knowledge. So it really has a key role and needs to be really looked into uh, when trying to think about uh, think, implement design, or even when trying to monitor or evaluate an initiative that try to improve the use of knowledge. Leadership plays a pivotal role and has the capacity to affect the other dimensions under the, the other internal dimensions within the, the state agency as well. The fifth uh, dimension, internal dimension, is, the, is management and processes, right? This has to do with the way things are being done. Like uh, a good way to understand is when, uh, when people come into the organization, they are taught <laughs> about how to do things. There are existing ways of making decisions, of discussing, and of course, also formal processes and informal processes that account or not for the use of knowledge in policy. So within management and processes, uh, we uh, discovered that there are sub-dimensions such as like uh, the degree of planning. I talked about the culture of strategic planning in the macro context, but maybe you have a country where there's, not, uh, there's no strong culture of planning, but you have a ministry where planning is really the way of doing things. So there you have more open windows of, of opportunity to incorporate uh, the use of uh, knowledge. And other sub-dimensions have to do of, uh, with the positions, right? Do the positions entail our job descriptions, including uh, some degree of use or production of knowledge for, for the work that people are doing, other formal processes already there so that it's easy to spend, for instance, some time to gather evidence before taking a decision. Uh, this has what has to do with monitoring and evaluation practices that usually are also good opportunities to open up uh, the production of new information and data and then synthesizing this to have good knowledge to uh, reframe or change existing current po um, policies as well as uh, the communications processes, right? Are there, uh, do for example, agencies have 
regular ways of communicating the evidence they use and produce with other agencies, for instance. Do they have regular meetings? Do, you have, do they have uh, annual sort of interactions or, or processes where they can communicate what they have, the knowledge they have produced, that they are using to other agencies and other stakeholders as well. And last but not least, uh, other resources are also very important. We uh, very, you could see, or we could see, uh, we could find within a state agency a strong desire by leadership and a capacity by senior management to use to use knowledge, a culture that is uh, opening up the opportunities, incentives, and the motivations. But if the organization, the state agency, does not have a budget committed uh, to commission, to use, or I mean, yes, to to produce or to hire or contract uh, research organizations or universities or other stakeholders to, to produce the, the knowledge that cannot be produced in, internally. Or if the agency does not have a knowledge infrastructure, does not have the technology, uh, the channels, the formal channels that even like we found uh, piloting this, that there are sometimes like the, 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 the sort of databases and where the storage of knowledge and information is very precarious. So it's very difficult that this uh, can lead into a strategic and um, significant use of knowledge within that the agency. And last but not least, time availability. The lack of time has been uh, mentioned as a very, very important factor in terms of having the chances to really leave space and room within making decisions and implementing to incorporate knowledge, not only when designing, but also when implementing and monitoring and evaluating uh, programs and policies. So as you will see, this is quite a complex <laughs> lens and the uh, flexibility has to do that. Uh, we have done work where some organizations have decided to uh, pre-select three, two, four of these dimensions and go deeply into them and uh, you wouldn't lose the capacity to, to see the whole system. Sometimes just by looking, for instance, if you say, I'm going to diagnose and understand how organizational capacity may affect this, what are the factors or sub-dimensions with the other dimensions that can affect or be affected by organizational capacity? That's another way to keep on and embracing uh, complexity, but also um, being practical and being having the chance to adapt the tool to the current and real needs of a public agency or an organization working with public agencies. It is very important to, when using this, to get as many pers perspectives as you can, probably when looking into any of these dimensions, different stakeholders, internal and external, we have different views. And to, have a, uh, to really use the lens in a rich way, it is important to do it uh, with a participatory spirit and, and exercising the collaborative mu muscles so as to get a, 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 a description and a, an understanding of the agency's reality that really reflects the variety that is uh, entailed within uh, its members and the all the external stakeholders with which the agency interacts. Uh, so that's basically, and maybe this is, is very Conceptual at this stage, uh, we have piloted this in Peru and Ghana and UNICEF and Peer Jobs is going to tell you more about on the ground work. Uh, but before that, I would like to open the floor to any comments or questions that you may have around the, the framework so that we can move on and based on this understanding on conceptual understanding of what the lens is and what it can do, we can go to uh, real practices and, and work on the ground to make this tool a useful device uh, for change. So any questions, uh, you may do it by raising your hand if you want to talk or write. Thank you. So let's see, someone has- Thank you, Vanessa. Good. We have Anna Purna. She used the uh, raise your hand. I will unmute you so that we can ask the question. We've been respecting privacy as well as our uh, in private respecting way, and not just for monetization. <sighs> Hello? 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 
Hello, Vanessa. Yes, I'm, I'm listening to two voices. Can you hear me? <laughs> hi, Vanessa, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, hi, yes. I, you know, I just wanted to say it was an excellent presentation. Uh, quite clear, quite good. And I don't have any questions as of now. I think I raised my hand by mistake. <laughs> okay, but nice feedback. But, Thank but you. it's lovely to hear you again. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so much, Anapuna. It's good to see that it, it was clear. Yeah. Let's see yeah. if there's anyone there having a question. Otherwise, we can move on uh, to third chats. I think we are fine. I don't know, Sarah. Do you think we should? Yeah, I think. I mean, I think can, I mean people maybe are also thinking about this. And once we go, I mean, we will have another uh, space for interaction and, and, and discussion. So if things emerge as you digest, we can uh, touch upon them a, a bit later within the webinar. Yes, exactly. Good. Thank you again, Vanessa, for the very interesting uh, webinar that you just presented now. Um, we can uh, let Kirchev present. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, Hi, hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we can hear you perfectly fine. Okay, so I I will be taking us through what we've been doing here in Ghana. I'm catch-ups at Englev, and I'm with Pax Africa. Um, so we have worked with this framework to develop it further into a matrix, very quantitative in nature, to help with the diagnostics of uh, of the different factors that, that that matter for evidence uptake within government agencies. And thank you, Vanessa, for the useful discussion on the framework. My pleasure. Sure. So the matrix as we have it now, we say it's an evaluative and advocacy tool. Evaluative because it kind of does a an analysis, quantitative analysis of the different um, issues that need to be looked at and building from what the, the, the framework um, presents, the, all those different factors that count that count when we are looking at evidence uptake within a context have all been considered within the, the matrix. And so that is how evaluative it is. And then it can be used as an advocacy tool because you get to see where your organization stands and in which um, factors are your organization doing better and which factors are you not doing better. Then it can, it in, it can inform um, kind of a, a design of interventions to address those issues that are lacking. And then you can have an improved um, space within the organization for, for evidence uptake. Next, we kind of emphasize um, how this tool is aim, aimed at um, taking advantage of opportunities because as the matrix was just presented, there are so many um, opportunities within uh, the reach of organizations for, for enhanced um, use of evidence. But then most often we realize that uh, most organizations don't, don't know these, either they are not informed, yeah, kind of. And so they, they kind of look out for specific kind of very na narrow view of opportunities. But this uh, framework gives you an understanding of all the different things that are available. So the matrix helps you to look at which opportunities you're doing well with and which other ones are available to take. If, 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 if there are some challenges you're experiencing, for instance, if there are other options that you can look out for and the matrix can help you to do that. It's also, as, as mentioned earlier, it's heavily um, informed by the, the framework. And currently we have about 
136 statements, very, very comprehensive, assessing uh, all the factors that have been spoken about. Now, there are some underlying assumptions which I would want us to have a look at. One is that uh, there are desirous qualities of an organization and a society that, that can be useful for improved evidence uptake. And uh, this is to say that within, within for every um, policy-making organization, government agencies is our focus here to work very well. There are certain things that are expected, you know, to be pre pre present within the organization in terms of the processes, in terms of the capacities, in terms of um, the resources available, its relationship with all other organizations. And these are what we mean by desirous um, qualities. Now, these desirous qualities, we believe, can be attained within each setting through, the, uh, through different approaches, different mechanisms for continuous capacity development. So capacity development could be the form of um, individual capacities when you realize there are skills and knowledge gaps. We could also look at uh, organization kind of um, development uh, where there are maybe um, uh, cultural issues involved when there are resource issues involved and things like that. So there are different mechanisms actually that can be used to address some of these uh, challenges to reach these qualities. Then we believe also that uh, opinions of staff and the associated members of an organization are able to provide valuable insights into how an organization is faring with respect to its uptake of um, research data and all of the kinds of evidence within the organization. And finally, we also believe that uh, these insights from the organization can, can be quantified and made to inform uh, initiatives to improve the uptake very objectively, even though they are coming from uh, members of the organization when we pull all these different views, all these different insights together, we can have a fair understanding of how the organization is faring. So these four assumptions are the kind of the driving um, force for, for use of the matrix. So this year, we planned to pilot the matrix, two pilots, were, were planned. One had been completed in March and the second one was to run from May to December. So we are still in the course of that. Uh, we may have to move a little into the first quarter of next year to finish with the second, the second pilot. Um, we did the first one with the Parliament of Ghana. The second one, where we are working with the ministries of health in Ghana and uh, Kenya, as well as the Ghana Health Service. The Ministry of Health in Ethiopia was supposed to be part of the second pilot, but uh, we're having some implementation issues, so that part of the work is not, is not moving at the moment, but we have these three organizations um, that are responding positively. Um, just yesterday, we, we, we confirmed a discussion to run another pilot at the local government level here in Ghana. So that brings us to three different levels. One, the international level with uh, different international uh, organizations. I mean, national organizations at international level. So we have uh, the Ministry of Health in Kenya and then in Ghana and then the Ghana Health Service. Then we have the nation, uh, national organizations, um, like the Parliament of Ghana. And then we have the third level of pilots, which will be at the local government level. And here in Ghana, it's the approach is to work it out with um, three districts, uh, which were selected up to, to, to represent the three different zones, geographic zones, across the country, so the northern sector, the middle belt, and then the southern part of Ghana. 
So these are just a few. Um, so because the third pilot is just been a finalized, the, the discussion had been finalized um, yesterday, that it was too late to update this to reflect that. So this discussion is um, focusing on the two pilots that we're doing. The first one are already done. And uh, it was exclusively from evidence producing and consuming departments within the same department of an organization as the Parliament of Ghana. Whilst in the second pilot, we are looking at a representative of the representative departments across the organization. So it goes beyond the evidence producing and consuming um, units. The first pilots also had uh, everything done within um, a day. The data collection, the analysis, and then its discussion was done within within 24 hours. Whereas the second pilot has taken multiple months to do, also because uh, it cuts across different geographic, I mean, national zones. The a third difference. So we, what we're trying to do is to look at the different ways that uh, we can we can deploy this matrix. I mentioned earlier working across the three different levels, international, national, and then sub-national. Then we can also look at different sectors. So for instance, the Parliament of Ghana is looking at the uh, Parliament as a legislative organization. Then in the second pilot, we're having the health sector, it's focused on the health sector. So you can run it with different organizations, just like uh, Vanessa mentioned earlier, there are different um, organizations that can, can that can deploy the framework, same as with the matrix. And uh, yeah, so this is a sample um, question that um, we decided to show to so that people can have a look at how the the, the the matrix is structured. So first of all, there is a data collection phase, which will uh, involve or which involves the administration of this um, questionnaire. And there's a sample question taken from the um, internal dimension on the, the the beliefs and values within an organization. So this one is so the questions are made. Uh, to be um, leading questions, that leading statements, I mean, that uh, the respondents will have to agree to or disagree. And this is how it is, um, it is, it looks like all across all the 129 questions, very extensive. And in the end, the when the data is all collect, collected, it will be collated into the matrix. So the matrix is a sample is what we are looking at now with the different organizations list, listed on the left um, side. And then the different dimensions will be on the right side. So dimension one, dimension two, three, four, five, and then there will be the final aggregate that tells uh, how how well an organization is doing overall, and then you have the opportunity to see how well they're doing across the individual um, dimensions, as well as we can see also for the sub dimensions. So, for instance, with the one we've done with the Parliament of Ghana that has been completed, so we saw that Parliament was doing somewhere just over an average performance, meaning there's still more room um, for evidence uh, I mean, to explore, more opportunities to be explored for improved uptake of evidence. And we'll have the opportunity to go into the different areas that Parliament is not doing very well. Then together with the organization, we can design interventions to address these issues that come up. So it can, it's applicable for different organizations and that is how we, we we were planning it so hopefully next year we will begin with we will continue with the, the deployment of the tool but then it's going to be adding up we'll be gathering more data and to add up to what we have already in the future what we're hoping that is uh, 
this to be scalable, adaptable, and to guide practice in that the, the data to guide practice, the data that we'll be gathering will be useful to inform how um, different practitioners, both government agencies, researchers, and intermediary organizations will be um, approaching their interventions, informed certainly by some of these, um, these uh, results that will be coming from the matrix. And it's scalable because we can expand it to include different organizations across multiple countries and uh, certainly depending on the resources that will be available to us and it's also adaptable to the different contexts and issues that will be um, will be coming up with then the data also we're hoping that uh, the data will everything will be hosted on one server so irrespective of the different countries organizations that will be deploying the matrix the data will be coming to us and then we will kind of uh, interrogate the data further to understand the trends within the different contexts what works within one context different from another context and hopefully we're we, we, we're looking forward to some kind of a, a formula development to, to 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 predict how much of what factor matters in which context so very very uh, quantitative oriented and uh, we're hoping that uh, we could we could make as much use from the, the the data that we will be gathering from this exercise at this point I will want to invite us as um, people I believe all of us here also have some roles to play within um, the space. So let's see what you think also because the tool, the matrix as it stands now is very quantitative. We, we want to open up for um, suggestions from you as to what form of a qualitative tool or method uh, can be used to, to, to augment the data that will be coming from um, a quantitative tool like this matrix. For instance, um, with the discussion we just finished on the local government approach, there is going to be interviews that um, we, we will be conducting to kind of uh, follow up on the, these issues that, have, that would come from, from the, the matrix results after it's the matrix is um, piloted within the three different districts. I mean, district assemblies, we will get to understand quantitatively what what uh, factors are doing well within the different um, districts and then there will be a follow-up on those specific issues to understand uh, more qualitatively the issues that would, yeah would have come out from from the matrix um, i would want to open up for um, thoughts from you also participants today by practitioners in your organizations to share your views on which other qualitative uh, methods that can be used. Zara, uh, maybe I'll open up for you to lead this round of the discussion. Thank you, Kircha, for this uh, very informative uh, presentation. Um, in case anyone has any question, please feel free to ask or even comment by using the raise your hand button and we can unmute you or if you want to type in your comment in the question tab. Seems uh, we're not getting questions. Is there? Hi, I just added also that if you want to share any insight um, about the use of the framework, that would be helpful for us to write if they find it useful and how how participants think it could be used within their 
current uh, work and initiatives? Sure. Um, we have uh, Shin Yir. She's asking if she can type her suggestion or thoughts here. Um, yes, of course, you can do that. Maybe as she does that, uh, I, I might share uh, our experience uh, shared by INAS and politics and ideas when piloting the framework in the Ghana, referring to the qualitative methods. Uh, okay. I think you have a, a very rich uh, quantitative base that can be used then uh, and complemented by conducting some focus groups uh, so that people can start taking meaning and detecting patterns uh, of what is revealed quantitatively uh, by listening, right, and focus groups listening to. Uh, they can belong to the same state agency or the parliament, or you can mix them, but also it's a way to, to gain some insights in terms of what uh, this uh, quantitative uh, information that you're producing uh, tells them and how, how they could foresee using uh, this uh, information to inform or this knowledge more than information with the knowledge to inform the work they are doing within their agencies to improve the use of knowledge. So focus groups could be a qualitative methods to complement your matrix. Um, we have a suggestion here from Shenir Oyugo Mbashu. She said that I would suggest a nominal group technique exercise as an additional data collection tool. Hmm. Maybe we should give her some space to, to explain further what she means by that. That's if she's willing yeah, to, I, I to can, talk. Yeah, I can yes. unmute her, of course, but she okay. asked if she can type it. Uh, so. It seems that there's background noises. Um, exactly. Yeah. Can you read out the uh, her question again? I didn't get it. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would suggest a nominal group technique exercise as an additional data collection tool. Um, Kirkup, if you can uh, just press on the question tab uh, under webcam, uh, you can see her question, it's written. Okay. Yeah. I'm not very sure of what she means by a nominal group technique. And Vanessa, I'm not, I'm not, I don't know if you've had an experience of that as a... No, it would be interesting if she can define it a bit. Exactly. But I have not heard about a nominal group technique either, but interested to learn. Sure. And I can't see what is written in the chat either. So there we will probably need your help, Sarah. Yeah, in the chat. Yeah, I can't see. Um, sure. Click on the question mark. And the, uh, ah, it's on the question. On yes. yes. No, I don't see questions. Uh, no. Under what? Ah, okay. Yeah, I see it now. It was, I need to expand it. Thank you for that, yeah. Let's see if Tinyere can add a bit more about this nominal group. And she also thanked Krika uh, for the excellent presentation that he gave. 
Okay. Any other um, qualitative to, uh, mechanisms apart from interviews and uh, focus group discussions? Maybe I would suggest a kind of an ethnographic approach that certainly would have to be to involve members of the organization or maybe an outsider researcher who can be embedded within the organization for a period of time kind of uh, working with them, so that could be done um, with uh, maybe associates who may be sent to the organization to, to work with them for a period, say six months, because ethnographic studies take a little longer time to do, then this researcher could get a better understanding of of the culture, the way things work, you know, beyond um, the descriptives. So that is one way I think um, that's one qualitative method that I think can be used. It would have been useful to see, to, to hear from other people what their experiences have been in terms of producing qualitative research. Or if you can still share, yeah, I mentioned interviews earlier, if you can still share your own experience of interviews, I think it would be useful. Great idea, the ethnographic. Uh, <laughs> I, I like that one, really good one. Uh, interviews, uh, like conducting, what we found is that the challenge of conducting interviews with these, uh, to, to, to have this like larger understanding is the challenge to select the right questions and maybe also um, have groups of questions for different profiles of interviewees, because otherwise uh, the risk is that those interviews tend um, to be really extensive and long. So a challenge with that sort of qualitative tool is to really determine and focus uh, specific angles or uh, sections or di sub dimensions that you want to look into. Uh, because otherwise they might be a bit challenging in terms of uh, people, usually especially policymakers don't have a lot of time for interviews, right? It's easier to do a more like quantitative thing that they can fill out quickly, but giving time is, is difficult. Even like uh, leaving space in their agendas for interviews can be quite daunting. That's very true, Vanessa. So maybe these are still early days to discuss the qualitative side of, of, of the matrix, of, of applying the matrix. And so uh, maybe we can finish up the webinar for today. And then, yeah, we might have to converge later to share more experience after we have done it for some more time. What do you think, Zara? Yeah, I think that's a very good idea, actually. So, um, should I wrap up now? Yeah. Oh, Vanessa, what do you think? Yeah. No, I, I'm fine. I, I, so, I think it has been a very good opportunity to share our work, and we're always open <laughs> to receiving or being contacted uh, by participants if they want to explore part of what we said uh, further. So we are available and willing to. Okay, so um, thank you. I wanna thank uh, both Kirkep and Vanessa for this great presentation. As for, for the attendees who are with us today, please make sure to follow us for other sessions of the Gassi webinar series. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send us to them and we can direct them to Vanessa or and Kirkev, or you can uh, contact them directly by yourself. Thank you again.